Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. The employment cost index in America coming in a little bit softer than expected. Yields push lower, equities push a little bit higher. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, the IMF sees a turning point for the global economy as China's economic activity rebounds sharply. The Fed's two-day meeting commences in Washington. We begin with the big issue, closing out a big month of gains. Huge rallies to start the year. Hallmarkings of a uh, January effect. Some real optimism airing in. Events that didn't didn't play out, essentially. Overall, the hard data is looking good. Frankly, that data just hasn't been negative enough to justify the low positioning. In January, we saw a boom in primary issuance in the capital markets. We do worry that the market's got a little bit ahead of itself. Those are all signs that the Fed doesn't like to see when they're trying to contain economic activity. The market is trying to call the Fed's bluff. Powell is very likely to remind uh, uh, the market that uh, the Fed's plan is to stay hawkish. Chair Powell is going to push back aggressively uh, around this bullish narrative. Can't imagine that, um, you know, with the Fed particularly, that, that Powell loves to see everything uh, flying higher. I would expect that he would push back against these financial conditions. Those animal spirits are not what the Fed wants uh. to be encouraging. Joining us now to discuss his principal is Seema Shah and J.P. Morgan's Tom Kennedy. Seema, first to you. I'm going to use your words. Here's the quote. After reaching a peak rate of 525 to 550 in the first half of the year, Fed policy will have to remain restrictive throughout 23, even as the U.S. economy falls into recession. So, Seema, can you tell me what separates you and this Fed away from this market, price and interest rate cuts this year? Yeah, it's been an interesting one. Um, I think what the market is, is still holding on to is that recession will be enough to convince the Fed <clears throat> to come in and provide that relief. But what we've seen historically is that, look, inflation comes down very, very slowly. We've heard from Powell time and time again that they're very concerned about their historical narrative, and they're very, very concerned, want to learn from their mistakes from in the 70s. So what we're saying is that, yes, inflation is going to come down. It is. It's going to come down towards 3%, but it's also going to be accompanied by economic weakness, and that is not going to be enough to convince the Fed until you get into early 2024 when they have clear evidence that inflation isn't going to research. Tom Kennedy, are you with SEMA or are you with this market? No, I think the Fed will be cutting this year. Um, you're well along the path for the desired outcomes from the Fed. You, the housing market in America, residential housing is in a recession already. Margin compression has started. The next phase will be defending those margins from, for corporate America. That most likely means layoffs. At this point, John, I think you're, you're at the place where layoffs are the most likely catalyst to give Fed confidence inflation will get back to 2%. Tom, this is a process, as you know. Why do you only expect those layoffs, though, in the second half? You're not expecting them anytime soon, based on what I've read from your research. So can you tell me why you do expect them in the second half? Yeah, I think first you're going to see, John, is that CapEx intentions will continue to get cut. Uh, we're getting clear indication that's happening here. The layoff piece is usually the last thing to go. We're all getting very impatient in this business cycle. Things are seemingly happening very fast, but for economics and regular folks in America, it tends to take a little bit longer. Um, the tech sector is there, John. I think it's the next sectors to really look for, construction, manufacturing. Those are the types of places where layoffs are most likely next. So Tom Standard Chartered and Steve England uh, put this out in the last couple of days. They said the incoming data would be soft enough for the Fed to pause in March. However, this week, the FOMC and Fed Chair Jay Powell will likely signal that there is not yet a conclusive case for a March pause. Now, I know this is really difficult to do, Tom, but if you can get to March 22nd, can you tell me where you think we will be? Because right now, claims at sub-190, claims are pretty down low. Yeah. Uh, John, I really don't know. Uh, I think you're going to get to a place where your 50-50 and optionality is their friend. I think that's what Powell's message should be this week. We're, we're slowing the pace, but optionality is our friend. And until we get our desired outcomes, which is a cooling in the labor market, it's unlikely that we will be able to ease conditions meaningfully. Simi, what's interesting about this is that you don't exactly disagree when it comes to the economy. Yeah. You're looking for that economic weakness. You just don't believe they respond to it in the way that you think, the way that Tom thinks they will. Why is that? 
Yeah, it's interesting. As Thomas was, was saying, I actually in agreement in so, many, in so many things. We are expecting economic weakness to come through in the second half. We are expecting job losses. We are expecting unemployment rate to, to increase. And we are concerned about housing. Uh, our concern is simply just this, that the Fed is worried. They've learned their lesson and they don't want to uh, be the Fed that makes mistake twice, letting inflation take off and then letting inflation take off again. So we think that they're going to stay pretty firm, even as the economic weakness starts to show through and real people start to struggle a little bit. We think that relief comes in 2024, but 2023 is about staying firm. That's going to be a big conversation for us around the news conference as well with Chairman Powell. 25 minutes away from the open and bell. Equity futures are a little bit positive, up a third of 1% on the S&P. Yields come in just a little bit as well on the two-year by four basis points to about 420. Mike McKee alongside me. Mike, you're just responding to the data we had about 35 minutes ago. Run us through it. Well, it was uh, pretty good news overall. The employment cost index coming in lower than it had been, and service industry wages lower than they had been. So that was pretty good news. Uh, here's a chart that explains the debate you guys are having right now and what Jay Powell has to do tomorrow. This is a historical through the last year and a half of the Fed and its dot plot and what the market thinks, which is your red line there. The market thinks uh, the Fed is off its rocker <laughs> at this point. Uh, over the last six months, they've decided uh, the Fed is going to have to cut rates and go down. And so you can see that in the dot plot. Now, what do they do about it? According to the latest uh, Bloomberg uh, WIRP, in terms of what the uh, Fed's policy is going to be, they're going to get to June. They're going to get to 5%, which is two more 25 basis point moves, one this week. Uh, and then they're going to start cutting rates. And we get down to a, uh, basically about a 25 basis point move lower by November. So the market needs some convincing from Jay Powell. Uh, maybe the ECI, as you mentioned, uh, does give us some reason for hope that inflation is going to come down faster. They've been worried about wages. This is the uh, indicator that they like to follow because it is uh, more comprehensive than others. And you can see uh, ECI is much lower and coming down at a faster pace, perhaps, than average hourly earnings and certainly than PCE. But if it pulls down uh, those two things, then uh, that's going to be good news for the Fed and reassure them a little bit that they can back off from 50 basis points down to 25. Mike, you and I have talked about this a lot. I think we know the question that will get asked in this news conference. Either you will ask it or one of your colleagues will. The question is, the unwarranted easing of financial conditions. Is it unwarranted? Is it warranted? Mike, when he's asked about financial conditions easing, how do you think he's going to navigate it? Well, I think he's going to say it's not particularly helpful, but the Fed is seeing the economy slow, even though we're seeing financial conditions get looser. And so he can't make the markets behave, but he's going to try to keep them from making things any looser by reacting immediately and start pricing in rate cuts. And Mike McKee, looking forward to your coverage tomorrow. Mike McKee there on the Federal Reserve. This came from Marco Kalanovic and the team over at JP Morgan in the last 12 hours or so, 24 hours. We believe investors should fade the year-to-date rally as recession risks are merely postponed rather than diminished. Postponed rather than diminished. Now, Seema, can I come to you on this? I think this is important. If you think that the recession is just delayed and not avoided, is that a tradable event? Is that something you want to buy or something you want to fade? What do you want to do in between? Because right now, over the last month, this market's really rallied and quite hard. It hasn't. It, this is the time to fade it. I mean, look, if the market is pricing in 75 basis point worth of cuts, it is expecting a recession. So for equities to be performing so well when it's actually anticipating a deeper recession, it seems to me that this is something that we should really fade. The fact that the market is running today is because it's looking simply at the fact that the Fed is near the end. It's closer to the end than it is to the beginning of its hiking cycle. And you're yet to see the economic pressure really break through to the surface. But if you look underneath, you can see that the cracks are forming. So I agree, this is a little bit delayed. This is looking at the second half of the year. It's not imminent, but certainly it's not going to be avoided. Tom, you agree on rate cuts, or rather you disagree on rate cuts. Do you agree on the price action? Do you agree on the market call? I think, I think the market price action is somewhat as expected. ECI is confirming that average hourly earnings have been telling us for, for a few months, in a three- or six-month annualized basis, wages have slowed. Michael McKee said it beautifully. This is a really positive outcome. And it cuts off the likelihood that the Fed will have to hike to 6% as an example. The market should price that. They should adjust. And the Fed is telling you they're likely to keep rates around 5% for the whole year because that's the most likely outcome. It's a modal outcome. But we as investors, we don't price modal outcomes. We price 
the possibility of things that could happen. And the point is really important. It's more likely than not they'll be cutting. So we have to see interest rates in the future come down. Now, risk assets, John, to come back to your, your, your central point here, risk assets will have this exuberance phase through it. I think we're there. You're pricing just markets, multiples in excess of 5, 10, 15 year averages against earnings that are too high. That doesn't mean there's not opportunities though. Where can we find value? Things that are relatively cheap. Places like small mid cap in the US, Europe is now looking, uh, pricing the same way. We're going to talk about Europe in just a moment. Can you talk to me about credit? Just briefly, Tom. Sub credit. 50 ISM, the Fed hasn't cut yet. We've already had the rally. Spreads are tighter over the last few months. What do you make of the move? I think the spreads there are too tight. I think for an investor in America that is a high taxpayer, subordinated bank capital is a better relative value opportunity set. High yield, is, high yield spreads are tight potentially because the yield is just so attractive, near almost 10%, and it's trading more like a yield product. We haven't seen anything like that in America in 25 years, but uh, relative value, I don't, see, I don't see much value there. Massive focus on fixed income coming into 2023. Tom Kennedy, Seema Shah sticking with us this morning. Yield to lower, Treasury's rallying, your two-year down four basis points, sub 420 now on a two-year, on a 10-year down five basis points to about 349. Coming up, the global outlook gets an upgrade. And what we are looking at is what effectively is going to be still a challenging year. But still, it's an upgrade compared to what we were expecting back in October. And this is due to resilience, resilience, resilience. Resilience, resilience, resilience. That conversation up next. are looking at is what effectively is going to be still a challenging year but still it's an upgrade compared to what we were expecting back in October and this is due to resilience 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 we've had more resilient households in the US resilience to the energy crisis in Europe labor markets have been very very tight and then in addition to all this you have the reopening of the Chinese economy that is promising to give a boost to global uh, activity the IMF seeing a turning point for the global economy, raising its economic growth forecast for the first time in a year as the Eurozone unexpectedly expands in the fourth quarter and activity in China rebounds sharply as the economy reopens. Bloomberg's Tom Orlick joins us now in Washington. Tom, good morning to you. Can you run me through just how big a bang, a boom you expect in the Chinese economy this year? So China reopened much quicker than expected at the end of 2022, Jonathan. Um, the immediate impact of that was a big slump in activity. Uh, China's 1.4 billion people under understandably decided they didn't want to get sick and they stayed home. What the PMI data for January is telling us is that that hiatus in Chinese activity has been over pretty quickly. Manufacturing, services, both bouncing back strongly, services certainly roaring back into pretty strong growth. Now, Bloomberg Economics has an above consensus call on China's GDP this year. We're looking at a 5.8% expansion versus 5.1, which is the consensus view. This early data from January certainly points towards a pretty strong year for Chinese growth. Tom, you and the team have written about this in the past day. In fact, I think it published this morning. Tom, can you walk me through how you think the story of the economy reopens relates to a story of Europe and the rest of the world importing inflation from China? How do you think that's going to develop this year? So there's two pieces to it, Jonathan. Um, the first is a welcome boost to global demand. Let's not forget that Europe is starting the year, if not in recession, then at least extremely weak. And most, including us, think the US is heading into recession at the end of the year. So China reopening is going to give a pretty welcome bump to the global economy. We think it adds about $500 billion to demand, the equivalent of adding an entire Nigeria to the global economy. The flip side of that, of course, is that stronger demand risks reigniting inflationary pressure. Um, 
We've looked at some numbers. We've put them into a model which relates China's growth to global energy prices and CPI in the US, Europe, and the UK. And we think that China reopening could be worth about 0.7 percentage points on the US CPI at the end of the year. Not massive in the context of a US CPI which was as high as 9% pretty recently, um, but still enough if it plays out that way to derail expectations of a Fed pause in the second quarter. Hey, Tom, that's a really important final point. Tom Olick there of Bloomberg Economics. Thank you. Back with us, Seema Shah, Tom Kennedy. Tom, how do you think about this issue? Do you see the positive, a better growth profile, or do you see the negative, the potential that we get a disruption, a more inflationary impulse from China reopening? I think we're mostly thinking it's a positive for the global growth story. The reason to fade a little bit of the optimism there is twofold. Number one is many are mapping the reopening that we've seen in the Western world to what we'll see in China. Yes, consumption will surge, but the excess savings and ability to lever up is not the same in China. We're closer to consensus on growth in China this year than what Tom just described for Bloomberg Economics. From an inflationary impulse, though, the vast majority of China's impulse for the last 10 years has been through the property sector, and that is a sector that is still languishing. So for the most part, we're focusing on the growth impulse rather than inflation. Seema, what about you? Look, I, look, I think we're focusing on the growth impulse, and we see that there is certainly international opportunities, and China emerging markets is a key part of that, that discussion. I think on the inflation side, it's a concern, it's a risk, that when you think that the market is pricing in almost a straight line down, um, this is something that would cause a fairly meaningful surprise. And if I just do back of the envelope calculations, if you expect core goods inflation in the US just to normalize to post GFC levels, it gets you uh, core CPA down to 3%. But any kind of upside surprise to that, and you're above 3%, and that's not a level that the Fed is going to be comfortable with. So I don't think, you know, we are focusing on the growth side, but that inflation risk, I think, has to be taken into consideration. So that risk on the horizon, let's see how that develops. In the meantime, Seema, everyone asking the same question, how do you play the China reopening story? My question would be, what hasn't participated already over the last three months? Where do you find those opportunities? That's a good question. It's, it's the one that we're getting all the time. Is, is, it, all, is it all done now? Um, what we're saying is that, look, maybe not look at China because there already has been such a significant move. Maybe start thinking about places like Latin America where they will feel um, at least some of the sun rays from China, but also their valuation is still extremely cheap and actually it's offsetting some of the political concerns in places such as Brazil. So Mexico, Brazil, Chile with commodity price moves, that's probably an area to focus on, as well as parts of emerging Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, who have also very attractive valuations and still that growth prop up to come. The Chinese tech's ripped over the last three months. The miners have ripped over the last three months. You've seen Caterpillar rally really hard over the last three months. The Euro stocks 50 in the last four weeks is up by more than 9%. Question is, Tom, for you and many other people, what's left to play for here? Yeah, we're, we're doing the same thing you are, Jonathan. They're trying to find places where there is value. China has rallied very quickly. There is still value there because earnings are inflecting higher, the only major economy in the world where that's happening. But I think for our clients where they're still underexposed to Europe, that's a better position to be in. Number one, it's still relatively cheap to its own history. Number two, there's still a significant discount to the U.S. stocks, which our clients tend to hold a lot in. And we just got two big surprises, a warmer winter and the China reopening, which should benefit the luxury and travel sector in Europe. I think that's got to be our focal point for the next three to six months. Tom, when you speak to clients and you push that story, my question is often this one. How receptive are they? to that story, given they've heard it so many times right. over the last five years? I, th I think it's a struggle, John, I'm going to be honest. I, they've been burned many times, but when you're trying to show them that a lot of the world is expensive, and this is a place that's relatively inexpensive, and it offers them an opportunity to, in addition to the point I made, diversify their FX globally, I think we're going to get some good reception on this. I told them other people would just say we're one rate cut away, a rate cut that you expect later this year from tech leadership reasserting itself. We've seen that over the last month and the U.S. leading again. Do you also believe that we will get this change in leadership, not just in terms of the kind of companies that rally, but where those companies are based? Do you get that new leadership? Is this truly a new regime? Yeah, I think it's going to be a new leadership from equity cohorts and where CapEx follows. It's very common to see leadership change. I mean, that's stating history as, as on the side of this call. But all the names, the big mega cap tech names that we've all owned for the last decade are seeing earnings growth slow. Their business models have matured. 
is it possible that they are returning capital to you and I, John, because they just don't have the same type of investment opportunities from M&A, CapEx that they once had. I think it's very possible. And from a CapEx orientation perspective, that was leadership last cycle. I think leadership in the next cycle is going to be more real economy based. And that favors Europe and other sectors of the US economy. Tom, in the meantime, just to jump in, you've talked about where we are in this process in the cycle. We are at yeah. that point, as you've stated, where companies are starting to defend margins, cut costs, and we're seeing that with big tech. Is that not enough for you? No, I don't think it is. I think from an investment perspective, everything I'm about to say leads to bonds. And bonds have rallied a lot. If we do get this recession that Tim and I have talked about, rates need to come down more. Um, the desired effects are there, and it's proof that these are restrictive rates. But what's really, I think, has to be enough, ECI is proving the worst case scenario of entrenched inflation is gone. But now we have a level discussion and it's pretty clear whether you look at ECI, average hourly earnings, or low, medium, uh, high income earners in America, they're all seeing wages around four, four and a half percent, and it's yep. too high. We need to see the labor market weakness to, to feel confident. Seema, I've got 30 seconds on the clock. You get a final word. Yeah, look, I, I agree. I, look, I think tech is going to be continue to be challenged. Yes, yields are going to come down further, but I don't think that's going to be enough. Uh, I think it's too early to talk about growth value at this stage, but once you get into 2024 and we're expecting inflation not to return to the sub 2% levels that we've had over the past decade. So that is a time for resurgence in value. And what does that point to? It points to Europe. Hey, Seema, great to catch up. Seema Shah there alongside Tom Kennedy, pointing to Europe. Equities right now in the United States, pointing to the US, pointing lower, rolling off session highs. We're now just about positive by a tenth of 1% or so. Coming up, the morning calls and later, cross marks Victoria Fernandez, sticking with staples and cyclicals amid continued macro uncertainty, looking for some balance around the opening bow. The opening bow, seven minutes away. Five minutes away from the opening bell, equity is still just about positive on the S&P 500, up a little more than a tenth of 1% off the back of that softer than expected employment cost index here in America going into that Fed decision tomorrow. That's the price action. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, CFRA downgrading Baidu to sell. 103 price target, expecting regulatory headwinds to remain a consistent overhang. That's stuck negative by 1.4%. Macquarie downgrading Paramount to underperform, highlighting the company's outside ad exposure and a stock's rich valuation. And finally, Atlantic equities downgrading B of A to neutral, warning that banks typically underperform heading into a recession, down about a tenth of 1% on that name. Coming up, expecting high yields to fuel volatility. That's the view from Crossmark's Victoria Fernandez. That conversation just around the corner. Your opening bell up next. Twenty-two seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning to you. Equity futures are just about positive by a tenth of one percent. The sentiment improves a little bit off the back of the ECI, the Employment Cost Index for the fourth quarter here in America. That comes in a little bit softer than anticipated. Equities get a lift going into the open. There's the opening bow switch of the board into the bond market, and yields drop a little bit lower off the back of that too, down four basis points on a ten-year. We break three fifty. 349.58 on a 10-year yield in the FX market, euro dollar 108.60. After the Fed, you go to the ECB. The Federal Reserve expected to go 25 basis points tomorrow. The ECB expected to go 50 basis points on Thursday. Let's round things out with a look at crude. We're down about six tenths of 1% on WTI, $77 and around about 40 cents. 20 seconds into this one, equities just about positive by a tenth of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, up a tenth of 1% also. One stock to watch at the open, Caterpillar, posting its first quarterly miss since the start of the pandemic as it grapples with rising raw material prices. For more, let's get to Abby. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, this one is interesting because not so long ago, just moments ago, it had been down just about three tenths of one percent. So really all over the map, holding that loss that it had earlier in the pre-market after posting this first loss since 2020. It's not all bad, though. They also put up pretty solid revenues. Uh, they beat revenues, in fact. So it's really the profit miss, not being able to manage those margins for the first time 
on rising manufacturing uh, costs. They also have a goodwill impairment charge tied to its locomotive business. In fact, we have some headlines coming out uh, recently in the CAT CFO saying that the material and freight costs increased 20% since 2020. So until now, this company has done a very, very good job of managing those costs and the earnings miss. It's less than 3%. So it's going to be interesting to see if this stock holds on to its loss. Right now, it certainly is down 2.5%. As for some of the good news, because, John, this is really interesting, and this is a surprise to me. Just last Friday, this stock at an all-time high. How many stocks can you say that about? It has something to do with this picture right here, that demand, record backlog, quarter after quarter, close to $30 billion worth of demand. So again, it's going to be interesting to see whether or not the 2.5% uh, loss hangs out for the day or if investors propel the stock higher on what are really mixed results, but the underlying demand is good. It's just a matter of managing those margins. It's down about 3% two minutes in. Abby, thank you for that. Big international story here. Caterpillar bottomed the same day the dollar peaked at the end of September, September 27th. And since then, Caterpillar has rallied by about 56%. That's accounting even for this move lower this morning. So a bit of context over the last three months for you. Caterpillar down about 3.3%. In fact, make that the last four months now. Earnings also coming from the energy sector. Exxon holding back on announcing any new buyback plans despite posting a record profit of $59 billion. Kaylee on top of this one. Hey, Kaylee. Hey, John. It's absolutely unreal the numbers we are talking about for the full year. And for the fourth quarter as well, Exxon beat expectations. Their ninth beat on EPS in 10 quarters. Contrast that with Chevron that actually missed in its fourth quarter report last week, but again, also reported a record for the year. So these two companies together, these oil majors, have pulled in nearly $100 billion in profit over the course of 2022. But another contrast, as you alluded to, is Chevron last week announced it was upping its buyback program to $75 billion. Exxon, though, did not raise its plan. They left both the buyouts, uh, the buybacks and the dividend payment as is. They're planning $35 billion in repurchases for 2023. But that is after expanding buybacks multiple times last year. And the company has signaled its intention to repurchase $50 billion of stock through 2024. Interesting to note as well, in 2022, Exxon returned about $30 billion to shareholders. Global capital spending, meanwhile, was only $22.7 billion. So this is a major reversal from much of the last decade when CapEx was higher than those shareholder payouts. And that could add more fuel to the political fire as the Biden administration really wants these guys to be pumping more oil, bring supply up to put prices down. And Darren Woods, the CEO, actually addressing supply on the conference call just now, saying that the oil industry is under investing in new production. He sees the potential for continued tight global mar oil markets as some producers pull back. And in theory, John, that could mean upside to oil prices. Looking for the White House commentary on that maybe a little bit later. Looking forward to that. Kelly Lines, thank you. About four minutes in, we are positive by two tenths on the S&P and the Nasdaq up by four tenths of one percent. Snap reporting after the closing bow as it heads for its best month of gains since 2021. Investors expecting results to shed some light on the state of advertising. Katie Greifeld has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Well, that's the thing. Snap matters because it's one of our first looks at what online ad demand looked like in the fourth quarter. We know that's been a sore spot for the industry at large and for Snap in particular. If you look at shares over the past year, I know they're up so far this year, but train your eyes on these red circles. As you can see, its last two earnings reports sparked sell-offs, and you can't forget when it cut its forecast in May. That's when the pain really started for this company. So that's Snap. That's after the bell today, but we also have EA and Spotify to look forward to today, and then we get to the real heavy hitters. I'm talking about Meta, Peloton, Alphabet, Amazon. And if we think about what's going to be the topic of conversation, it's probably going to be cost cutting, layoffs and margins all going to be in focus as the pandemic era boom fades for a lot of these companies. And John, the stakes are high when you think about the big tech resurgence that we've seen so far to start 2023. The Nasdaq 100 at this moment, it's up about 9% so far for the month. That's the best January since about 2019. So we could be setting up for a big reality check as these earnings roll in. And you can't forget the Fed tomorrow. What a run. Katie, thank you. Yeah, today, to Katie's point, you've got to talk about it over the last 12 months plus. But yeah, today, Snap up by 25%, Meta up by 24.4%. Worth pointing out that when it comes to Snap, just look at the price sanction over the last quarterly reports we've had. On October 20th, the stock was down 28%. In the quarter before that, the stock was down 39%. That's one day price action 
after the results. So that probably gives you a decent idea of some of the moves you can expect in a name like that one. Social media stocks having a great start to 23 after a major down year. City's Kristen Biddley telling investors to stay cautious on the rally. I don't like this rally. Going into the end of last year, you had a lot of tax loss harvesting. You also had the most bearish positioning that we've seen since the global financial crisis. And when you look at what's driving this rally, it's all of the laggards and losers from last year. And so this is more of a technical rally. It's not something that has fundamentally changed. Cross Marks Victoria Fernandez echoing that view and looking ahead to Chairman Powell writing the following. We still aren't completely convinced that there is an all clear signal for a sustainable rally. There is quite a bit of macro uncertainty, but at the same time, we have companies saying things are looking pretty good. This gap is what is going to be difficult for the Fed to decipher. Victoria joins us right now. Victoria, first question then. Are you loving this rally or hating it? <laughs> well, I'm not loving it. I don't want to say I hate it because I think you can be opportunistic in this rally. You can trim some names that have done really well, take a little bit of money off the table and put it off to the side and wait for an opportunity to do something different. So don't hate the rally, but I don't think we're in a sustainable rally at this point. I just don't think that we have cycled through the things we need to through the earnings through the rest of the rate hikes, through the rate hikes that we've already had and their effects that are going through the economy. You, there's so many different elements out there that we still need to churn through before I think we can say we're in a sustainable rally, but use it to your advantage. So how do you use this to your advantage? Yeah, well, look, I mean, some of it is what we were just saying. So we've trimmed American Express. You know we like financials. It was one of our favorite sectors last year. We like it again this year because they have strong balance sheets, and we think that rates are going to continue to go a little bit higher from where they are here. But you have American Express that's up 12% year to date. Why not trim some of that, take some of that money off the table, put it into some other areas? Names like Lowe's, names like Aflac, we like insurance, or General Mills. I mean, you can find other areas in order to put some of that cash to work, but I don't think you want to make big bets at this point in time. There's just too much uncertainty, and we do think we're going into a recession probably around the middle of the year, so you need to be careful. Well, let's talk about those big tech names that have rallied hard, and let's assume you're right. We go into recession pretty soon in the next couple of quarters. Victoria, how do you think those tech names perform in that recession? I think it's going to be quite difficult, Jonathan. I mean, obviously, we've had a little bit of a rally here. And in my opinion, it's a, an oversold rally, right? People are coming back in, names are at the bottom. And that's fine if you didn't have these names in your portfolio and you're trying to build a little bit of a position. But I think you have to be very cautious. These names are still in downtrends. So when you have starting to get an overbought position in a downtrend, that's a really dangerous place to be. And look, like I said, I don't think it's a sustainable rally. You want to look for new leaders leadership once you hit uh, the bottom of the market and you're starting to turn and have a sustainable rally, you want new leadership. These are the names that led last time. So I don't think it's where you want to look going forward. Have a little bit of exposure, but be cautious. Victoria, let's just build on that just a little bit. Why are we so convinced there will be new leadership? I hear that from a lot of people. I've heard that a few times already this morning. Why are we so convinced we get new leadership? There are some people out there who just believe we're a couple of rate cuts away from old leadership reasserting itself and big tech absolutely flying. Well, and I think that's the issue. A couple rate cuts away. When are we going to get rate cuts, Jonathan? I don't think we're getting them in 2023. I think the Fed is going to raise, uh, obviously, this week. They're going to raise again in March. I think they're going to hold for the rest of the year. So if you're waiting for rate cuts to give a rally to the tech names, I think you're waiting at least a year from now. So there's better places to be in the next 12, 18, maybe 24 months instead of these names. And I know everyone, I mean, it, it's the tradition, right, that you're going to have new leadership coming in. But there was so much brought forward during the pandemic for these names that I think you have to take a step back, say thank you for the gains that you've given me. Now we need to look other places. Chairman Powell speaks tomorrow. Victoria, what are you expecting from him? Yeah, so I think we'll get a 25 basis point hike. It's what's priced into the market. But I think where I differ probably from other people is I think he's going to remain somewhat hawkish in the press conference. I mean, if you look at all of the items that people are saying, this is why 
the Fed needs to stop. We have a stronger um, economy, even though growth has gone down, it's somewhat strong. Um, we've got consumers with demand that's there. It's, we, we can have a soft landing if they just stop now. But these are the same elements that I think Powell is looking at to say, we haven't gone far enough. We know the Fed wants to err on the side of higher rates. They're willing to go into a recession. They've told us this. So I think he's going to be a little more hawkish in the press conference than maybe what the market is pricing in. And I actually think there is a risk. They could go 50 basis points based on the strong labor market that we're seeing, the GDP numbers, inflation numbers still being sticky. I know the ECI numbers came out today and they were a little bit lower than expected. But on an annual basis, we're still over 5% for wages and salaries um, on ECI growth. So I still think there could be an opportunity for 50 basis points tomorrow, but a slim one. You think they can go 50? How do you think that would be received? I don't think it would be received well. I think the market would be very upset with that. Like I said, there's a big gap right now between what the market expects is going to happen and I think what Powell is laying out in his plan. Um, you can see it in the rate cut expectations. There's already at least 25 basis points worth of rate cuts priced in for either September or December of this year. I just don't think we're gonna see that. I mean, Jonathan, let's look at these recession indicators that we have going right now. You have LEIs up over 7% year over year, the inverted yield curve, M2 growth. We haven't even talked about what's going on with M2. There's all sorts of elements wrapped up into M2 growth, still 4 trillion of excess there, yep. which is why financial conditions are easing. So I think Powell could go 50. I don't think it will happen, but he could. Let's say goes 25. And you know for the market, it's not about what he says, it's about what he does. And what he's going to say is one thing. How this market responds to it is another. And that's why we've got to make two guesses tomorrow, Victoria. You've got to guess what he's going to say. Then you've got to guess how the market's going to respond to it. Now, let's say he says that the easing of financial conditions over the last few months is unwarranted. Do you think the market's actually going to respond to that in a material way, Victoria? Because over the last couple of months, they've all been on the same page. They've all been saying the same thing. They're saying what you're saying, which is no cuts this year, and yet still we're priced for cuts. Why does that change with the words of Chairman Powell tomorrow? I'm not sure it changes with his words because the market, I think, is actually looking through some of what Powell is saying. They're already looking um, towards the end of the year and into next year where they think it's all going to end up in the same place. The timing may be a little different, but the end game they think will probably be the same, which is somewhere around a 5% terminal rate. So I think that really the market reaction tomorrow would be if we got 50 instead of 25. You might have a little bit of movement um, from the press conference if Powell is extremely hawkish but if he sticks to his story I think the market says yeah yeah we've heard this before we're going to continue with what we think is going to happen with the assumption that the Fed is going to match the market instead of the other way around. Victoria this was great as always Victoria Fernandez there of Crossmark about 13 minutes into this equities at the moment positive a third of one percent on the Nasdaq of six tenths of one percent coming up GM delivering a stronger than expected outlook. Our engineering and manufacturing teams uh, partnered with our supply chain teams, did a great job of uh, increasing production uh, last year by 25% uh, over 2021. That's next plus, the EV pricing war heating up. Ford following Tesla with price cuts. That conversation just around the corner. quality of our launches and, and the new vehicles that we've brought to market um, uh, are really being received well by our, our consumers. Our engineering and manufacturing teams uh, partnered with our supply chain teams did a great job of uh, increasing production uh, last year by 25% uh, over 2021. Uh, and, uh, and we've been seeing vehicles move very, very quickly once, they get, uh, once we get them to dealers. GM reporting better than expected results. The CEO, Mary Barra, giving an upbeat forecast, writing the following. We expect our momentum to help us deliver strong results once again in 23. Kaylee, back on a story. Hey, Kaylee. Yeah, that 2023 guidance much stronger than expected. They expect profit between six and seven dollars a share, even at the low end that tops the average analyst estimate at five dollars and 70 cents. So a really healthy beat there. What's driving that is healthy volumes. Small sales volumes were up 41 percent in the fourth quarter from the levels a year ago, and they expect that 
that volume to be up 5 to 10 percent uh, this year as well. That's helped by the fact that supply constra chain constraints are easing, so they're able to increase production and increasing production of electric vehicles in particular. Mary Barra saying 2023 will be a breakout year for their Ultium platform and that they're on track to produce 400,000 EVs in North America from 2022 through the first half of next year. So put it all together and the market really likes this GM up 8 percent, lifting peers higher as well, just continuing the outperformance we have seen from autos this year. But we know the autos narrative has changed in recent days, John, amid buzzing about a price war. We got some interesting comments coming out of the analyst call in relation to that. Mary Barra saying that the models are priced where they need to be. And the CFO, Paul Jacobson, saying he may see more discounts on models increasing this year. But he went on to say they are not preparing for a price war, John. And no cuts just yet. No big cuts anyway from them. A stock's up by more than 8%. Katie, thank you. Katie, talking about that EV price war heating up in a big way. Ford slashing prices on its electric Mustang. In response to Tesla's recent discounts, RBC expecting more cuts on the way, seeing a cascading effect across the industry. Bloomberg's David Welsh joins us now in Detroit for more. David, can you run me through what you think about what we've heard so far from Ford, from Tesla, and what you're expecting next? So if you look at the price cuts that Ford and Tesla made, uh, they are big. It does tell you that there's serious competition now in the elect electric vehicle market. But in a way, a lot of what they did was scale back price increases that they had put in last year when everything in the market was scarce, including internal combustion vehicles, and, and everybody was fighting to find chips to build EVs, gasoline-powered vehicles, everything. So now that demand's a little softer, now that you've got more competition than just Tesla in the EV market, uh, and, and Tesla has a lot of production coming online, by the way, uh, you're, you, you're seeing this pullback in pricing. Very interesting that GM doesn't think they're going to have to do that. And here's where I, where I think they're going with this. First half, they're going to be slowly ramping up all of these Ultium-based vehicles, like the Hummer uh, SUV and the Hummer pickup truck, the Cadillac Lyric, and then eventually you have two Chevy uh, SUVs that will compete directly with the Mustang Mach-E and with Tesla models, and you'll have the Chevy Silverado pickup. But the real production boost for General Motors will be in the second half. So they probably don't need to discount anything right now because they don't have that much production to sell. It's not like there are a bunch of General Motors made electric vehicles sitting on dealer lots that need a discount to move. So in the near term, they're probably right. Second half is where you'll, I think you'll see the true test of whether or not GM has to discount because you'll see these vehicles that compete directly with the Mustang Mach-E, like the Chevy Blazer, like the Chevy Equinox. They also compete with uh, Tesla Model Y and Tesla Model 3 in terms of price range. And that's when I think you'll see the pressure with these new vehicles coming out. And then we'll know whether GM is able to hold price there or not. Hey, David, very well framed. David Welsh there out of Detroit. GM up by more than 8% right now. Got some breaking news for you in the last couple of minutes. Just on some economic data, here's Mike McKee. Tying it in well, John, because the Chicago PMI is generally related to how the auto industry is doing a lot of manufacturing plants there. And it's down slightly, 44.3 from 44.9. Uh, it was forecast to go up just a little bit. So they're still struggling with uh, some contraction in the Chicago manufacturing area. Tomorrow, the ISM manufacturing comes out. That's going to be the interesting one that everybody wants to watch. The regionals have all been uh, mixed, uh, half up, half down. So no good call on that yet. Put it all together, Mike. 25 just now, Dom. We heard maybe 15 minutes ago, Victoria, talking about the potential for 50. How surprised would you be by 50 basis point high tomorrow? Less surprised that I would have at some changes in other meetings, but I think they've left the impression they're going to do 25 at the markets, and there's no real reason to surprise the markets now. Mike, looking forward to your coverage, as always. About 22 minutes into the session here, we advance a third of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq, up a half of 1%. With some sector price action, here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, we do have most sectors higher with that small gain for the S&P 500, and consumer discretionary really outperforming performing on that GM quarter. UPS also putting up a good quarter. So both of those shares higher. Eight GM up by about 8% as we saw. UPS by about 3%. So that is the sector that's leading the materials, communication services. On bottom, energy, utilities, and financials. And it's interesting, we are, of course, in uh, earnings season, as you know. And relative to the sectors that hold on to Post number gains, well, it's discretionary. And this number uh, so far up 3.7%. It's likely to go higher after today with GM and UPS. We also have materials, communications, and uh, financials in there. The industrial is also holding on. We'll have to get tech in there and see what's going on for that tech sector, whether or not those stocks hold on to the gains. Abby, thank you. Looking forward to Snap a little bit later. Your trading diary up next.
following the biggest one day loss of the year so far in 23 on the Nasdaq. We try and bounce back by six tenths of 1% on the S&P up by about three tenths, four tenths of 1%. That's the price action. Let's get you the trading diary. President Biden in New York discussing infrastructure at 12.30 Eastern, a Fed rate decision Chairman Powell News Conference on Wednesday, followed by earnings from Meta. Rate decisions from the ECB and BOE coming on Thursday, plus results from Apple, Google, Amazon all coming up. And finally, jobs day in America to round out the week on Friday. Special coverage of the Fed tomorrow on this show. Fantastic lineup for you. For the nine o'clock hour, we have Kathy Jones, Bob Michael, Chris Harvey, and Mike Wilson all coming up tomorrow, nine o'clock Eastern time. Do not miss that. Looking forward to covering all those stories with you. From New York City, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>